What are you afraid of? Sound like that, man? Yeah. Hey, this is my scary voice. Back up. Oh, what? I need. What brings you fear? Hey! <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's a heck of a way to lead into it. Uh, welcome back to the Steam, gentlemen. Delving into the deepest and darkest parts of your fear. That's it. We are here. We are in the belly of October. The belly of the beast itself. Absolutely. Here on the dark side, finding out what scares us. In particular today, we're going to dive right into those films that scared us the most and why. So that you know... As you're walking around, you'll know what these three men out here are still afraid of a little bit to this day. But let's bring it back in. We are here. We are in the steam tunnels. I've assembled again the secret council uh, to here to push forth our nefarious agenda to remind you of a time when we used to play with the Atari joystick when that was the most bomb <laughs> toy on the market. Absolutely. <laughs> Loved having your Atari. Remind you of your, your uh, remind you yeah, when you I had the- that came out the way it was supposed to. Hey, whatever, you know, come on. This is an explicit show. They can handle it. Uh, we had, don't, don't forget. Remember uh, when we played with our, when we, we had Nintendo and you had the robot that came with it, the robot I'm using uh, air quotes there. That was I remember the, that. I remember that rich kid on the block who had, and we went over there just to see that shit, but not really to play with or hang out with the kid. Yeah. I absolutely. That. No, I, that kid was in Framingham in my years, by the way. Um, <laughs> shout out to the Where fam. I grew up. Shout out to Aptown. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, you know, and going all the way from, from mixtapes. We remember those as well when you made the mixtape for your girl, trying to try to impress her. She made one for you. Yes, you know. Well, it was all well, this is a win. Don't act like you don't still do it. Uh, my, my wife's going to get fish. She's going to be like, where's my mixtape? But <laughs> Where's your cassette player? Where's the cassette? Yeah, there's that. She made, actually, she made, she burned me a CD though. So we take it up to that point. She did before our uh -huh. first, first uh, before our first vacation to uh, Aruba, no less. She, uh, she made me uh, a mix. She burned me a CD at that stage of the game. But oh. what, traveling through all those, all those great all moments in pop rap. culture. What was that? It was all gangster rap. Oh yes, definitely. <laughs> There's nothing like a, a, a Canadian into hardcore gangster rap. Let me just tell you, well, that is that is the epitome of sexy. My so. mind's playing tricks on me. <laughs> we have Good call Canadian. out. You're here. You're hearing them all here. You're hearing them all. They're on fire today. We had a we had a great great talk before the show. So we're we're clearly in it. We're clearly in the the milieu, if you will. But let me start by introducing the three of clubs. Rashawn Smith, shout out to F-Town. Shout out to F-Town. F-Town's one and only. How you doing this morning? I'm doing fantastic. How are you, sir? I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. Waiting for you to throw me some curveballs, waiting for you to raise that eyebrow and say, what the hell are you talking about? It's, I, mean, uh, I throw it right down the middle, man. Just because when I'm throwing the wiffle ball, I can't control where the hell that thing goes, man. That's aerodynamics. That's physics. I mean... That's so you're, a screw, you're a screwball pitcher. That's what you're saying. It's like, hey, I just let it go. I don't know where it hell it ends up. Okay, yeah, like I said, man, it's a wiffle ball. It goes where it wants to go. <laughs> I'm telling you, the Red Sox, the Red, after last night, the Red Sox could use you without a doubt. So, and oh, yeah, speaking of speaking of Red Sox and, and a fellow fan, how are you doing this morning, Star Child? You all right? You stay up too late last night? Um, yes. Actually, mm -hmm. we did, we did, we did stick it out, but it's all right. I'm up, I'm perky, I'm sufficiently caffeinated. We can do this. That is all you can ask for in life, and maybe just a little bit more when you really think about getting caffeine in North America and how impractical it truly is. It's just a, a wonder of modern modern culture and necessary. Right. You shut you your know. mouth when you're talking to us. Don't you, don't you besmirch caffeine like that? I'm not besmirching it. I think it's absolutely essential and i think it's probably the only thing that has kept us from truly imploding to the dystopian landscape that i expected it to be by now <laughs> <I think that's laughs> it. <laughs> it's just when you think about the supply chain problems that we're having and that coffee could be on that list try to you know when it comes to really what scares me for, fuck all the movies i'm going to talk about that is the scariest <laughs> prospect by far 
is an the uncaffeinated fact that New England, an uncaffeinated New England, an uncaffeinated America, man. It's just like, you know, shit, as annoying as the rest of the world finds us, they're like, fuck it, get them their coffee. I don't care. They can, you know, they can run out of toilet paper and every other goddamn thing. Just get them their fucking coffee or they're just going to be insufferable. It's That's fair. Be, it's going to be terrible. Bad. But we, are, we may we, slow the fuck down and actually become real humans. Eh, possible. <laughs> Do we want that though? Do we? I, I, we uh, want, yeah. Like I said, this is cutting into that. It cuts into that territory of segueing into fear, and that we are in my favorite month. I, I think it's you. I think I think I've got two brothers in arms here when it comes to loving Halloween and certainly loving the spooky movies and the spooky season. That we are, we're here back in our second season and loving that it's october that the you know apple picking weather is here and blood is here <laughs> fear <laughs> is here death is here but we really did want what to what apple farms here. are you going to oh you know you gotta you gotta pick the right ones that that you know mix the genres together my kids are terrified let me just tell you that much <laughs> they don't eat apples anymore they're just they're absolutely petrified but we did want to dive into the fact that you know, we got three three grown men here who grew up watching horror movies, who love horror movies, even though they're all filled, as we talked about last week, they're all filled with all kinds of tropes and even arguments about really what makes a horror movie or versus what makes a thriller and everything else in between and why we still watch them and really why we why I like them. And the fact is there is that element of fear. And why do we want, you know, want to be scared? Uh, why is it so in some ways harder to get scared the longer you watch them and, and the, 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 as you start to take in the tropes uh, what is the fun of that what is the meaning of that and you know what what does it hold like what does the significance hold within our lives and within the pop culture you know within pop culture and the zeitgeist of our times because let's face it we're hardly alone in this i you know all all two of our listeners out there i'm sure probably enjoy horror hey hey. hey how many well i'm just saying don't we're respecting you too. Well, that's true. I have nothing but respect, but I'm sure they love, I'm sure they absolutely love horror movies like we do. And society at large, you know, there's a reason why in a couple of days they're going to make yet another Halloween movie, right? The guy who was underneath the mask in the first movie makes his living going around uh, the, the conference circuit joking about what a bad concept it was to name a horror movie Halloween. He literally just says this over and over again about how fucking corny it was. And I'm directly <laughs> quoting the guy. <laughs> yes, he goes there and he's like, I'm in this movie and it's called Halloween. Boy, that's fucking original. Um, that's some balls for someone who's <laughs> under a mask the whole time. It's like, bro, doubt, you can man. get replaced at any moment and no one's going to even care. And he did. And he did. But they still have him in a cameo. They still had him in a cameo in the last one. But there you go. Right. So what is this? What is the significance? Hey, me, me. I'm, I'm Michael. I'm Michael. Um, he's the, you know, what is the significance? Why do we keep coming back to it? Why do we keep spending our money on it? We've seen it. <laughs> but when a good one comes along, we will all talk about it. We will all jump in on it. And we will spend these next 31 days trying to jam in as much of new and old scares as we possibly can. So that was our subject matter that we wanted to bring to the table today. So we're going to turn it over to the star child himself, give him his 10 minutes of fame here, and just let him talk to us a little bit about what truly scared him today, tomorrow, yesterday. Take it away, star child. Greg, what you got for us? Oh shit! I mean, you know, I, I'm going. I'm going to try to be as insidious as this uh, 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 subject, because uh, you mentioned, you know, John Carpenter, and John Carpenter did the thing, uh-huh. right? The thing in 1982, and uh, I'm going to paint a little uh, uh, picture for you. You know what I mean? It was uh, early 2000s, and somehow I ended up in a dorm somewhere, <laughs> and um, you know, like we were just hanging around their rec room. And um, this movie was on and that was actually I saw it that late, like it was just late and the thing was on TV. And that's when I first saw the thing. And it's one of the first movies that I could honestly say turned my stomach. And that was not what I was planning on doing that night. I just imagine this long, (laughs) dismal rec room and, you know, all of a sudden I am just transfixed by this movie that I did not see going this way because, you know, I see the actors and I'm like, holy fuck, that's Wilfred Brimley. 
<laughs> and it had me. I was like, holy shit, what's, what's Wilford Brimley doing in a movie? And I, I just, right, seriously. And I'm just, I, it's one of those movies. And this is one of those, the reason I picked it is because it gave me the movie experience I think you should have, which is before I knew it, I was locked in. I was locked in. Like I could not look away, no matter how grotesque this movie was getting. And the thing was, it was like, you know, people talk all the time about the practical effects. And by that time, they were still pretty dated. And they hold up because there's something surreal about that type of puppetry and grotesquerie that honestly stuck with me. So I knew, I've heard the name, but I knew nothing about this movie going in, which is also one of my favorite experiences. Like I love not knowing anything about a movie, nothing about the background or the story and just going straight into it. So like I said, I was totally hooked. The body horror shocked the shit out of me. Why in particular body horror, it's kind of like, you ever watch someone's, you know, leg go the wrong way in sports or something uh, like that? Like just, yeah, exactly. Like that kind of guttural, ooh, like it's more than just, oh shit, you know, he hurt himself or he got, you know, tagged with the ball or somebody elbowed him. Like, no, when you see someone's arm go the wrong way, when you see a shoulder get just totally jarred out of position, like it, it hits you a certain way. And that's what was happening. Like all of these contorted bodies being ripped to pieces and all of the flesh and Greg. it was it was go it was gore but it was fleshy gore not bloody gore and that was still new to me at the time go ahead i was saying two words for our generation joe theisman right yeah, right Monday night football oh we saw it over and over again the guy had the little little yellow marker he was putting around it so just in case you missed it kids yeah Actually, um, uh, 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 Gordon Hayward from the Celtics a couple of seasons ago, like, because yep. now they only they say we're only going to play it one more time, and then we're not playing it again, because they know that there's kind of a you know uh, a perverted horrific thrill about it, <laughs> you know. But um, you know that's one of the things that made this movie a classic. So what else made you know like why does this stand out to me? Like I said, it was my first experience with fleshy gore not bloody gore um that's why i picked this over hellraiser which you know uh, was my favorite horror movie definitely is on my list but this kind of fleshy gore and the fact that the I, people don't give the craft of this movie enough credit and that's that's really the thing that got to me after watching it again and watching it again and just looking at what he did to create the atmosphere. And I feel like that's something that a lot of horror movies have lost, you know, like he goes to the trouble creating the atmosphere, making sure you have that sense of dread, you know, like the first thing is the setting. It's out in the middle of nowhere, you know, like what would you do under that kind of isolation? So that's one thing that makes you feel cut off automatically. Two, a uh, true story, fun fact, he actually kept the set cold on purpose because he wanted everyone to constantly be cold and constantly be uncomfortable. Another fun fact, he didn't tell the actors who would be the thing in some scenes so that even they would be surprised if they were the one that turned out to be the thing. You know, like just little things like that that made the atmosphere stick out too. It's, a, well, it's an Antarctica, right? Like it's out, it's in a frozen tundra, you're not going anywhere. And these guys are just totally, totally cut off, you know, and it's dark and no one is ever certain. And I feel like that's one, th another thing that people, it, it draws you in and always makes you feel a little unnerved. You know, the, the fact that RJ, Kurt Russell's character is never sure of what he's doing. He's never sure. And you're never sure with him, you know, which brings me to the acting. You know, like the, the acting and the directing, this was, is one of probably one of our special favorite times, but like definitely one of the best times because it was the, 